Hello and welcome to Winning Paths Podcast, your guide through the exhilarating world of archery. Whether you're a seasoned archer or just dipping your toes into the sport, this podcast is your go-to resource for everything archery related. Our podcast is a bi-weekly rendezvous with fresh episodes dropping every Sunday. We are thrilled to take you on a journey exploring the rich tapestry of archery, from its storied past to the cutting edge present and even glimpses into its exciting future. Winning Paths isn't just about the sport, it's a celebration of the passion and dedication that fuels the archery community. Join us for riveting monologues and insightful interviews, covering a spectrum of archery topics. From the historical roots that anchor our beloved sport to in-depth equipment reviews, we've got it all. Expect fascinating tidbits, little-known facts, and explorations of archery's role in historical and sociological contexts. In essence, it's your one-stop shop for all things archery and beyond. Your participation is crucial to the heartbeat of winning paths. If you have suggestions, insights, or a burning desire to share your own archery journey, we want to hear from you. Connect with us at tfm.news and become a part of shaping the podcast's future. At Winning Paths, we're on a mission to continually enhance your listening experience. We value your feedback and are dedicated to delivering maximum value to our community of archery enthusiasts. So, buckle up, stay tuned, and immerse yourself in the world of winning paths, where the pursuit of excellence in archery knows no bounds. Hello and welcome to another captivating episode of Winning Paths. I am Marcin Malik, your today guide through the annals of strategic brilliance and historical intrigue. Join me on a riveting expedition as we delve into the heart of medieval Europe, where the threads of social upheaval, famine, and epidemics wove a complex narrative. The Hundred Years' War emerges as a focal point of the journey that takes us to the determining moment of the Battle of Crecy in 1346, where bows and crossbows vied for supremacy, leaving an indelible mark on the canvas of military history. As we unravel the layers of this historical tableau, we'll scrutinize the strategic choreography of Edward III, King of England, and the consequential missteps that led to the unraveling of Philip VI, King of France. From the nuanced socio-economic transformations following the Black Death to the diplomatic intricacies of feudal disputes, our exploration navigates the complexities that set the stage for this monumental clash. The Battle of Crecy, fought on the undulating terrain, wasn't merely a contest of arms, but a crucible where leadership acumen, tactical innovations, and the unforeseen quirks of weather converged. Edward III's meticulous orchestration, from the strategic expedition in Normandy to the fateful crossing at Blanchetac, reveals a monarch attuned to the nuances of both terrain and adversary. Winning Paths podcast is your vessel to take a closer peek into these occurrences. Welcome to the TFAM time machine, capable of unraveling the mysteries that shaped the course of history. In the latter stages of the medieval epoch, Europe found itself ensnared within the intricate web of social upheaval. A tumultuous period, spanning from the 1315th to the 1317th, bore witness to the harrowing Great Famine, followed by the malevolent onslaught of the Black Death epidemic from 1348 to 1350, coupled with an array of military conflicts extending from 1337 to 1453. The scarcity of precise data notwithstanding, mortality rates, approximating 35% in rural hinterlands, stand testament to the cataclysmic toll inflicted upon society. The aftermath of these afflictions precipitated a cascade of consequences, engendering societal debilitation, exacerbating labor and expertise scarcities, and precipitating economic vicissitudes. Pertinently, the diminished populace gave rise to social unrest, compounded by challenges in procuring a competent workforce. The reverberations extended into the military sphere, where dwindling recruitment pools necessitated a commensurate augmentation in soldiers' remuneration. Consequently, this demographic constriction engendered transformative adaptations in military structures, characterized by a reduction in size concomitant with an augmentation in the professionalism of military cohorts. 
the ramifications of these socio-economic metamorphoses burgeoned into the emergence of Western European states from the vestiges of feudal dominion, which continued to persist in Eastern Europe. The focal theatre of conflict during the critical juncture ranging through the 14th and 15th centuries is colloquially identified as the Hundred Years' War. This protracted engagement unfolded between the dynasties of England, represented by the Plantagenets, and France, under the aegis of the Valois lineage. Rooted in a feudal dispute over territories governed by England, the origins of the war can be traced to the Paris Treaty of 1259, which sought to mitigate tensions by subjugating the English king as a continental vassal to the French king in a feudal context. However, this accord proved untenable, for it posited the legitimate ruler of England as a vassal to the French sovereign on English territories on the continent. The paradoxical predicament of a rightful ruler, assuming vassalage in his own dominions, necessitated resolution, initially sought through matrimonial alliances and diplomatic maneuvers. These negotiations saw both parties grappling with the intricate nuances of pledging allegiance, unraveling the complex tapestry of fealty by the English king to the Capetians. Edward III of England, stemming from maternal lineage through Isabella of France, manifested a familial connection as the grandson of Philip IV and the nephew of Charles IV, the ultimate monarch of the Capetian dynasty. The legal precept of 1316, prescribing female succession to the French throne, ostensibly constrained Edward III ascendancy. However, his lineage, fortified by maternal support, conferred upon him a legitimate claim to the throne. The initial acceptance of Valois dynasty rule by the English faction, lengthening the interval from Philip VI's assumption of power in 1328 to 1337, was an epoch marked by diplomatic quiescence. Nevertheless, this truce was disrupted by escalating tensions stemming from Philip VI's strategic alignment with Scotland, catalyzing renewed hostilities. The demise of Charles IV prompted Edward III to assert his claim to the French throne through coercive means, heralding the onset of the Hundred Years' War. Within the context of this protracted conflict, conventional modes of warfare underwent a metamorphic shift with the integration of contemporary armaments, strategic methodologies, and alterations in military composition. The Battle of Crecy, transpiring on August 26, 1346, between the forces under Edward III, King of England, and the substantially larger army, led by Philip VI, King of France, epitomizes this transformative paradigm. This engagement culminated in the decisive defeat of the French forces and the decimation of their knightly and Genoese crossbowmen contingents. The inquiry into Edward III's attainment of this remarkable victory and the concomitant catastrophic unravelling of Philip VI's military prowess serves as a pivotal scholarly pursuit. Edward III, orchestrating a formidable army encompassing 4,000 men-at-arms and 10,000 archers, augmented by Welsh and Irish auxiliaries, underwent a strategic expedition to Normandy, propelled by the council of the French exile, Godfrey Harcourt. Confusion caused by the absence of local knights and squires, caught up in the siege of Aiguillon, underlined the prospects of a triumphant raid and the capture of spoils in the unfortified towns of the region. English forces commenced a systematic pillaging and devastation of the raided province, replete with agricultural abundance, affluent nobility, well-stocked conveyances, equine assets, and livestock. Strikingly, the invaders encountered minimal resistance as they navigated through this prosperous expanse. The King of England, Edward III, adeptly mounted his troops, strategically halting at well-selected intervals, capitalizing on the copious provisions afforded by the fertile land. The mere whisper of impending invasion spurred the local populace into a hasty exodus, leaving the path open for the marauding English forces to exploit the defenseless towns of Barfleur, Cherbourg, Montebourg, and the fortress town of Carentan. Notably, the denizens of Carentan, gripped by apprehensions, opted for capitulation, surrendering their possessions, and thereby unleashing a two-day deluge of assault and pillage. Edward III further directed his attention towards the mercantile hubs of Saint-Lô and Caen, distinguished for their opulent material and textile resources, 
embellished by the presence of revered abbeys such as St. Trinity and St. Stephen. The formidable defences of Caen, guarded by both castle garrison and inhabitants, succumbed to the English onslaught. Remarkably, swayed by the counsel of Godfrey Harcourt, at this juncture, it is opportune to embark upon a brief divergence into the persona of Geoffroy d'Arcourt, elucidating upon the intriguing trajectories that have defined his life's course. Geoffroy d'Arcourt, scion of the noble lineage stemming from John III d'Arcourt, Viscount of Châtellerault and Saint-Sauveur, and Alex de Brabant, descendant of Godfrey of Brabant, acquired the epithet the lame due to a pronounced physical infirmity, specifically a deformity in one of his lower limbs resulting in a distinctive gait. This notable figure underwent the ceremonial accolade of knighthood in the year 1326, subsequently assuming the prestigious role of the Viscounty of Saint-Sauveur in 1330. A seminal juncture in his narrative unfolds in 1339, as he, in collaboration with his elder sibling John IV of Harcourt, aligns himself with the fifty principal Norman barons solemnizing their allegiance to King Philip VI of France for prospective participation in an English invasion. The culmination of this ambitious endeavor transpires in 1340 with the annihilation of the French fleet during the Battle of Sluys, marking the denouement of the Flanders campaign, where Geoffroy d'Arcourt played an instrumental role alongside six knights and thirty squires. The narrative takes a captivating turn as Harcourt embarks on the matrimonial pursuit of Jeanne, scion of Roger V Bacon, and sole heiress of the Bacon of Mole lineage. Amidst this matrimonial overture, Guillaume Bertrand, scion of the enduring rival Robert Bertrand, also seeks the affections of the heiress. The predilection of King Philip VI towards Guillaume further kindles Harcourt's ire, precipitating a private war against the Tancarville family, commencing approximately in 1343. The royal intervention manifests with severity involving the confiscation of Harcourt's assets and the execution of his steadfast adherents in April 1344. Accusations of conspiring with King Edward III of England to install Harcourt as the head of the Duchy of Normandy result in a grim fate for the implicated loyalists. Compelled into exile, Harcourt seeks refuge in his Flanders estates, expressing gratitude to his cousin, Duke John III of Brabant. Endeavouring to reclaim his Norman strongholds, Harcourt undertakes a journey to England, pledging allegiance to Edward III in his capacity as the King of France. Letters patent from Westminster promise recompense for his Brabant lands and reinstatement in his Norman holdings. In 1346, Edward III appoints Harcourt, alongside Thomas de Beauchamp, as the commander of one of the three army contingents landing at saint vaast la hougue Harcourt assumes a pivotal role in the English campaign through Normandy, capturing Saint-Sauveur and participating in the conquest of Caen. Noteworthy is his intervention to halt the massacre of the populace and his presence in the English king's retinue during the triumphant Battle of Crecy. The demise of his elder brother, Count John IV of Harcourt, fighting on the French side, instigates a remorseful turn, leading to negotiations with Philip VI for a return to the French allegiance. Securing a pardon from Philip VI, Harcourt ascends to the position of captain ruler of Rouen and Caen in 1347, endowed with the authority to levy taxes and muster troops. This allegiance shift prompts Edward III to confiscate Harcourt's English holdings. A subsequent refusal to pay homage to Charles, Duke of Normandy, heightens tensions, culminating in Harcourt's obstinate defiance. The saga further unfolds with Geoffroy's nephew, John V, Count of Harcourt, apprehended and summarily executed by King John II of France during a banquet at Rouen. Geoffroy narrowly evades the king's machinations, subsequently realigning himself with Edward III, designating him as the legatee of his fortress of Saint Sauveur. In a charter issued on the 18th of Juli in 1356, Harcourt solidifies this renewed alliance, earning Edward III's protection and the endearing epithet of cousin. In an audacious move towards the close of November in 1356, Harcourt endeavours to ambush a French raiding party at the ford of St. Clement in the Bay of Vais. Despite his strategic manoeuvre, Harcourt finds himself encircled by eight French men-at-arms and a multitude of archers. Spurning the opportunity to surrender, he defiantly declares, By my mother's soul, the Duke shall not have me alive! Opting for a valiant stand, 
Harcourt succumbs to the blades of the French soldiers, concluding a chapter marked by tumultuous alliances and unyielding resolve. Ah, oh, well, certainly, as I mentioned, this is an exceedingly intriguing figure, and I couldn't resist bringing it closer to your attention. So, returning to the topic, King Edward exhibited clemency towards the city's residents while conducting the transfer of spoils, comprising trade commodities, jewels, textiles, silver, gold, and ransomed prisoners via water routes to England. The gravity of the English depredations reached the ears of Philip VI, who, spurred by a vow to avenge the affronts to France, resolved not to permit the invaders to depart without confrontation. Mobilizing a fierce coalition of allies, including the King of Bohemia, his son, dukes, earls, barons, soldiers, knights, and squires, Philip VI marshaled an army of unprecedented magnitude, eclipsing anything witnessed in France over the preceding century. The objective was to interdict Edward III's passage across the River Somme, compelling a confrontation on French terms and positioning the river as an impediment to English retreat. French garrisons, manning crucial river crossings, stood resolute against conquest. An insightful twist in the narrative unfolded as English king, leveraging intelligence gleaned from a captive acquired during reconnaissance sorties, identified a strategic opportunity to traverse the river at a locale referred to as Blanche Tac. This site, distinguished by a twice daily recession of water levels to below knee height and a stony riverbed, facilitated the unimpeded passage of wagons, horses, and foot soldiers, circumventing the ostensibly insurmountable French defense strategy. This astute maneuver bore testament to Edward III's tactical acumen, presenting a pivotal juncture in the unfolding saga of the Hundred Years' War. Under the stewardship of Godemar du Fay, Baron of Normandy, this crucial crossing was the target of an assembled defense of the Blanche Tac. In command of 6,000 infantry and Genoese crossbowmen, augmented by contingents from neighboring regions, Du Fay assembled a weighted force of some 12,000 men. The ensuing scuffle on the river resulted in the deaths of many noblemen from both the French and English factions. While the Genoese crossbowmen initially posed a formidable challenge during the crossing, their resilience weakened under the constant lash of English archers, culminating in the tactical retreat and subsequent fleeing of Godemar du Fay's forces. Edward III, apprised of Philip VI's moves, deployed his weight near Crecy upon crossing the River Somme on the last Friday of August, 1346. Articulating his strategic rationale, Edward III asserted, let us capitalize on the topography at our disposal, for we shall proceed no further until our adversaries manifest here. I possess the legitimate claim to await them, inheriting this land through the Queen, my mother, to whom it was bestowed in matrimony. This challenge is extended to my adversary, Philip Valois. The pivotal engagement unfolded on August 26th, with Edwards ensconcing his forces near Crecy, anticipating the imminent arrival of the French sovereign, Philip VI, and his assembled army. The meticulous preparation and strategic deployment, leveraging the advantageous elevated terrain and optimizing archers' firing range, emerged as instrumental facets of the ensuing battle. Edward, adopting a defensive stance, oriented the northern, left, flank towards the village of Wadicourt, while the southern, right, flank faced Crecy and the River May. The forces were methodically compartmentalized into three segments, in the first, 800 men-at-arms and 2,000 archers, supported by 1,000 Welshmen. In the second, 800 men-at-arms and 1,200 archers. And in the third, 700 men-at-arms and 2,000 archers. Divergent numerical attributions to each unit abound in historical sources, introducing a measure of ambiguity. 4,000 on the right, 800 men-at-arms in the middle, 2,000 archers on each flank with daggermen at the rear. On the left, 500 men-at-arms, 1,200 archers gathered on each side, with a reserve of 700 men-at-arms and 2,000 archers. Each nobleman, presenting himself afoot beneath his heraldic ensign within an amalgamated formation, alongside archers for mutual safeguarding, instituted an unprecedented tactical paradigm. This stratagem, devoid of cavalry deployment, signified a departure not only from conventional military doctrine, 
but also from societal norms, as knights traditionally belonged to the noble echelons, whereas archers predominantly hailed from the lower social strata. In this instance, they coalesced into a unified force, transcending social stratification. Furthermore, the chivalrous contingent served as a protective bulwark for the less armored archers. Edward III, assuming a hands-on role, meticulously scrutinized each of the three divisions, instilling in his troops the imperative to engage in combat on his behalf and in defense of his regal prerogatives. Unit preparations extended until the ninth hour, following which soldiers were afforded respite and nourishment in assigned zones. In the face of a conspicuously larger French military assembly, such a tactical configuration prioritized practical exigencies over ostentation, meeting the soldiers' necessities and safeguarding the ruler's prestige. Edward demonstrated a judicious approach to strategic considerations, optimizing unit capabilities aptly and mitigating unnecessary risks, all while extending personal support to his forces. Conversely, the French forces grappled with class prejudices and organizational shortcomings, impeding the emulation of a similar strategic resolve. The French army's pronounced reliance on heavily armored cavalry elicited countermeasures from Edward, encompassing pit excavation, the erection of obstacles before the archers, and trench construction with pitch to impede cavalry charges. Within the French ranks, a prevalent egocentric belief in swift triumph coalesced with avarice, fueling a fervent desire to secure high-ranking prisoners for ransom. As Philip VI neared Crecy, emissaries were dispatched for reconnaissance, prompting a swift repositioning of the English forces in anticipation of impending conflict. Intelligence reports advocated repose and postponing the assault until the subsequent day, deeming the enemy to be primed and rested, while the French contingents were ensnared in disarray, perpetually arriving and fatigued from the rigors of travel. Despite Philip's adherence to this council, a relentless influx of troops and nobility persisted, fostering a tumultuous throng devoid of organization, impeding their approach to the awaiting English forces. The French knighthood's perception of King Philip as more of a companion than a sovereign figure precipitated a reluctance to comply with directives, with some even contemplating defiance. The issue of command came to the fore, revealing Edward III's mastery in overseeing both the lower and noble classes under his dominion, particularly evident in the amalgamation of disparate ranks during battle preparations. This stands as a testament to the evolution of the feudal caste system in England, while the entrenched feudalism in the French psyche perpetuated the principles of chivalry and glory on the battlefield. Observing the pervading disorder and conspicuous insubordination within his ranks, Philip VI, discerning the need for immediate action, dispatched his contingent of Genoese crossbowmen, numbering 15,000, to spearhead the assault. However, the initial response from this unit was one of weariness and reluctance. Today we are ill-prepared for combat. Exhaustion impedes our capacity for noteworthy military exploits. What we require is respite. As the Genoese crossbowmen initiated their advance in disciplined formation, uniquely representing the solitary unit of the French army on the battlefield, an unforeseen tempest ensued. Following the storm's passage, the radiant sun cast its luminance upon the English forces, while directly impinging upon the ocular faculties of the Genoese. Pressing forward, impervious to the English volleys, the crossbowmen discharged a solitary volley before entering the lethal range of the English longbows. The ensuing fusillade of English arrows precipitated widespread panic among the Genoese, prompting them to cast aside their weapons and initiate a tumultuous retreat. Philip, in response, issued the directive Eliminate these troublemakers, for they vex us unjustly. Chaos, with the retreating masses succumbing to successive volleys, thwarted the mercenaries' attempts to withdraw and resulted in the demise of numerous cavalrymen who, adhering to orders, engaged in retribution against the fleeing mercenaries. The English shot wherever they saw a large gathering. Sharp arrows penetrated the armored men and their horses. Many fell, horses and men, among the Genoese, and when they fell, they could not rise again. The press was so great that one knocked over another. The historical discourse has extensively delved into the question of the limited efficacy of crossbows during the Battle of Crecy. 
Scholars widely concur with the acknowledgement that the crossbow strings became saturated during the rainfall, resulting in a loss of tension. This, in turn, impacted the velocity and trajectory of the bolt, diminishing the projectile's reach. Conversely, the English, adeptly navigating the inclement weather, expeditiously detached the strings from their longbows, securing them beneath their helmets to shield them against moisture. Noteworthy is the comparative simplicity of removing and reinstating a string on a longbow, a process taking mere seconds. Conversely, the tensioned crossbow string, reliant on a substantially stronger and abbreviated bow, proved impractical for detachment in the absence of specialized tools or a supplementary string, especially in the crucible of battlefield conditions during combat. Numerous factors exerted influence on the efficacy of crossbows during the Battle of Crecy, encompassing environmental conditions such as temperature and the intense post-rainfall sunlight. Additionally, the waterlogged terrain posed a formidable challenge for crossbowmen, impeding the establishment of stable support for the preparation of their crossbows. The consideration of combat speed and the rate of projectiles discharged from bows or crossbows introduces another dimension. The intricate mechanics of a crossbow, requiring time for string tensioning, bolt loading, aiming, and firing, stands in stark contrast to the swifter operation of a bow. Depending on skill proficiency, an archer could unleash two to four shots in the time it took to execute a single shot with a crossbow. It is worth noting that while bow proficiency demands extensive training, a crossbow, when equipped with a spanning device, could be wielded even without prior training. Delving into the inefficiencies exhibited by crossbows, a consideration of the material composition of the strings is imperative. During the 14th century, flax and hemp were prevalent choices, prompting speculation on how these materials responded to water exposure and elevated temperatures. It is pertinent to highlight that the crossbows of this era did not feature steel bows, but rather composite ones, distinguished by a shorter range and power relative to the steel bows emerging in the late 14th century. Composite bows, crafted from yew wood, bone, tendons, and glue, boasted enhanced power, thickness, diminished weight, and augmented durability compared to their wooden predecessors. Strings were affixed using cords, ostensibly fashioned from analogous materials as the strings and tendons. The later adoption of clasps featuring steel bows was prompted by concerns about the edges of these bows cutting the bindings. Hence, a critical question emerges. To what extent did meteorological factors and the materials used to produce the cords, together with potential nuances in bow mounts, affect the performance and achievements of the crossbowmen at the Battle of Crecy? Part of the scrutiny should be directed at the positioning of crossbowmen in relation to strategically placed archers, particularly considering the direct intrusion of sunlight into their line of vision. Their visual impairment, coupled with the necessity to shoot uphill, significantly impacted accuracy. Noteworthy is the deployment of large pavises, worn on the backs of crossbowmen due to the substantial duration required for reloading their weapons. After discharging a shot, they would retreat, reload, and be shielded by the pavis. These protective shields were also borne by attendants, accompanying crossbowmen into battle. Strikingly, Foissard's depiction of the Battle of Crecy omits mention of these protective shields. The absence of reference to pavises, in conjunction with the initial refusal of the king's command, hastily issued amid the continuous influx of troops onto the battlefield, suggests the potential non-utilization of pavises, perhaps en route on wagons, thereby compelling crossbowmen into an assault devoid of their primary defense, engendering considerable losses. Some sources refer to the role of certain units, presumably English, Irish, or Welsh, traversing the battlefield on foot and equipped with prodigious blades. These troops, known as rogues, systematically engaged the retreating French, in particular, the dispatching of the wounded, leading to the demise of numerous noblemen, earls, barons, knights, and squires, left unfit to fight on the battleground. The King of England, allegedly unhappy with this unexpected turn of events, envisaged taking these people hostage. This sequence underscores the comprehensive breakdown of the French offensive, plunging the battlefield into disarray, encompassing the French mercenaries attempting withdrawal, the wounded, 
and the fallen cavalry. English peasants were depicted as actively butchering French knights within this tumultuous milieu. The valorous demise of King Bohemia, Charles Luxembourg, merits acknowledgement, wherein the visually impaired monarch, tethered to his knights, charged into the fray with the intent to meet his demise through the delivery of at least one sword blow. Harried by the relentless onslaught of several thousand archers, the French forces succumbed to defeat, prompting Philip VI, wounded, to effect a strategic withdrawal from the battlefield. The aftermath of the battle underscores a deficiency in key acumen on the part of the King of France, coupled with a conspicuous absence of morale and compliance among the French nobility. This manifested in their disregard for the King's directives, careening recklessly into the throes of battle. Despite possessing a substantial numerical advantage, these factors coalesced to yield colossal and gratuitous losses for Philip VI's army. Emotions, avarice, and self-interest emerged as contributing factors to the French forces' defeat. Hence, the Battle of Crecy serves as a harbinger of an emerging military paradigm, initiating transformative changes in the conduct of warfare and inaugurating the decline of chivalry in the medieval peerage. This epical event marked a shift away from the conventional heavy cavalry model, favoring the superiority of infantry, tactical deployment of terrain, skillful use of available units, and single-minded but decisive leadership underlined Edward III's spectacular triumph. Casualty figures, albeit subject to variations contingent upon disparate sources, approximate English losses at 100 individuals. In contrast, French losses oscillate between 11,000s to 12,000s, inclusive of 1,200s knights, and from 15 to 16,000 of those falling below the knightly status. A comprehensive analysis of military engagements during this historical encounter necessitates a meticulous examination of the contending armies, encompassing their purported numerical strength, unit compositions, strategic dispositions, positional considerations, and geographical alignments. Moreover, a holistic evaluation mandates the scrutiny of technological arsenals, leadership efficacy, and the intangible factors of morale and obedience. Paramount among these considerations, as underscored by the paradigm of the Battle of Crecy, is the pivotal role played by leadership acumen and strategic discernment. This involves a nuanced comprehension of actions in relation to potential outcomes, a cascading chain of plausible results the judicious deployment of concentration, the exploration of alternative solutions, and anticipatory planning. The application of critical thinking within a strategic framework offers clarity in understanding actions and their prospective consequences, enabling optimal decision-making through the evaluation of contextual factors such as terrain, weather, and situational advantages, coupled with the assessment of available resources, including military unit capabilities and technological assets. Exemplifying shrewd poise, Edward III moved deftly around the battlefield, carefully minimizing avoidable risks to his forces. Noteworthy was the thoughtful integration of heavily armored knights into infantry formations, as opposed to the conventional cavalry deployment, thus increasing the protective shield for less armored units. The deliberate placement of archers at key vantage points, optimizing their range of attack, made them the backbone of the army that ultimately contributed to the triumph. Conversely, Philip VI grappled with the formidable challenge of managing his allies and subordinates effectively, precipitating instances of insubordination and incurring substantial losses. The dearth of meticulous preparation and the hastiness of actions precipitated the obliteration of crossbowmen units. This demise, inflicted not only by the precision of English archers, but also by the unintended consequences of French cavalry maneuvers, resulted in intimidating losses for the French forces. The repercussions of leadership lapses and the absence of strategic forethought were acutely felt, underscoring the importance of cohesive and discerning command in the theater of warfare. While there are not many direct quotations from historical sources of that time, we may look up some contemporary chroniclers and later historians who have provided accounts of the battle. One notable source is Jean Froissart, sometimes known as John Froissart in English, died circa 1405. 
he was a French-speaking medieval author and court historian from the Low Countries, who wrote several works, including Chronicles and Meliador, a long Arthurian romance, and a large body of poetry, both short lyrical forms as well as longer narrative poems. For centuries, Foissart's chronicles have been recognized as the chief expression of the chivalric revival of the 14th century kingdoms of England, France, and Scotland. His history is also an important source for the first half of the Hundred Years' War. Here are a few quotations and excerpts related to the Battle of Crecy. The archers and the men of arms of the prince's battle stepped forward one pace and kneeled down on the ground for the sharpness of the arrows. Then the men of arms of the second line passed over their heads and kneeled down, the one battle by the other, and their archers went between the men of arms and shot arrows in the air, so thick that it seemed snow. When the Genoese felt the arrows piercing through heads, arms and breasts, many of them cast down their crossbows and did cut their strings and returned discomfited. Then there were divers hard encounters and stroke is given, and many a man overthrown and hurt on both parties. In that rencounter, the Earl of Alençon and the Earl of Flanders with the Earl of Blois fought with the prince with their banners near them, but finally they could not resist against the puissance of the Englishmen, and so there they were also slain and divers other knights and squires. And the first battle that they made was with the Englishmen and Welshmen against the King of Bohemia and his company, and they fought long together. The Earl of Northampton and the Earl of Arundel, with their company, fought with the King of Bohemia, and always he fought in the foremost front and did marvels in arms, and so they did on both parties. The English archers, who were in the front line, having sat down on the ground, placed their pointed stakes in front of them, and shot so wholly together that the one part of their bows rested on the ground, and the other part shot right in the French faces, so that they had no shield nor other defense against the shot of the archers. Then the Lord Charles, Duke of Normandy, and his brother the Lord Philip of Burgundy, the Lord James of Bourbon, the Lord John of Artois, and divers other knights that were of the French party assembled together, and began to march again in good order toward the prince's battle, whereas they thought to have found none resistance. Then came there in the Duke of Lorraine, in the French king's aid, with a good number of knights. But when he saw the business lost, he departed, and so did other lords. There was slain, among others, the Duke of Lorraine, the Duke of Bourbon, the Earl of Alençon, the Earl of Flanders, and many other. Also the same day, the King of Bohemia, who was called Charles of Luxembourg, for all that he was nigh blind, when he understood the order of the battle, he said to them about him, Where is the Lord Charles, my son? His men said, Sir, we cannot tell. We think he be fighting. Then he said, Sirs, ye are my men, my companions and friends in this journey. I require you bring me so far forward that I may strike one stroke with my sword. They said they would do his commandment, and to the intent that they should not lose him in the press, they tied all their reins of their bridles each to other and set the king before to accomplish his desire, and so they went on their enemies. The Lord Charles of Bohemia, who wrote himself King of Almain and bare the arms, he came in good order to the battle, but when he saw that the matter went awry on their party, he departed, I cannot tell you which way. The king, his father, was so far forward that he strake a stroke with his sword, yea, and more than four and fought valiantly, and so did his company. And they adventured themselves so forward that they were there all slain. And the next day they were found in the place about the king, and all their horses tied each to other. Another interesting source are the records of Thomas Walsingham, died 1422, was an English chronicler, and is the source of much of the knowledge of the reigns of Richard II, Henry IV, Henry V, and the latter reign of Edward III depicting the decline of the state of affairs of the English. He also documented the careers of John Wycliffe and Watt Tyler. He spent most of his life at St. Albans Abbey, Hertfordshire, where he was superintendent of the copying room, Scriptorium. His works include the Chronicon Angliae, controversially attacking John of Gaunt, and the Padigma Neustriae, Chronicle of Normandy, justifying Henry V's invasion, 
and dedicated it to him in 1419. The Earl of Northampton, when he saw the first line thus weakened and almost destroyed, came to the assistance of the prince, his nephew, with the troops that he commanded. He pushed forward through the ranks of the archers and spurred his horse into the midst of the enemy, breaking their line and scattering them in all directions. The Welshmen who were making an attack on the right, seeing the discomfiture of the French and the pursuit by the king and his forces, returned suddenly to the field of battle and fell upon the stragglers and plunderers who were seeking booty in the French camp. The English had chosen a strong position on a hillside with a windmill at the top. They dug pits in front and fixed stakes to impede cavalry charges. This position had only one approach, and that a narrow one, flanked by thick woods and a marsh. They placed their archers in front, supported by men-at-arms. When the Genoese crossbowmen came up, they gave ground. The Genoese crossbowmen had gone forward on foot to meet the English bowmen, but when they were within shot, the English let fly their arrows and killed many of them. And others, to escape from the arrows, rushed on towards the men-at-arms, thus hindering the front line. And there you have it, dear listeners, the intricate dance of bows against crossbows at the Battle of Crecy. I hope you found our today's journey as riveting as the clash of arms on that fateful day in 1346. As we bid adieu to this episode of Winning Paths, I want to express my deepest gratitude to all of you, the intrepid travellers through time and tactics. Your curiosity and passion for archery history make this podcast a truly rewarding exploration. If you enjoyed our adventure today, make sure to follow us on Spotify and spread the word among your fellow archers and history enthusiasts. Remember, the past is not just a chronicle of events, it's a treasure trove of lessons waiting to be unearthed. So, until our next expedition, wherever it'll take us.